I'll give you a little bit of context, right? So yes. as you know, COVID-19, everybody's doing their thing. You know, some people are doing well, others not so much, but we're all kind of wanting to make things happen. Um, mm. And obviously when COVID-19 hit, I'm involved with an agency called The Brave Group and I run a software engineering business called Bridge Labs. Um, okay. And it was just that moment where, you know, you got this all this time and you're now, you know, having to really be in your head about a lot of things. And I'm pretty sure you can mm. appreciate that. And yeah. so the, what I did effectively is I went and I started looking through all my old diaries because I, you know, I keep, you know, fairly detailed notes, not as much as I used to. But when yeah. I was younger, of like all the things I used to come across and it was like, oh my God, the world's going to end. I can't believe it. I will never be able to do it. <laughs> and then you read like, yeah. you know, the following day, it was like, okay, actually it wasn't that bad. Um, yeah. And so I looked at that and I looked at all the other businesses and people that I kind of respected and how they were going through stuff. Um, mm. And I really just wanted to get into the headspace of people that have done amazing things, even through such tough times. Um, yeah. A, to, you know, as a personal reflection, but B, yeah. you know, as a paid forward, because, you know, some people just often think that, you know, it becomes easy and, you know, glamorous and, you know, stuff just happens. Um, yeah. But I've increasingly really realized that documenting these things becomes important. I'm, yes. not, I'm not the yes. guy that's like making videos every single day. I just don't have the bandwidth, but I yeah. did promise that I'll try and do like series. So I'll try and like package okay. you know, videos over a period of time. Um, my yeah. life is not set up to be, you know, creating stuff every single day. So unfortunately yeah. this is the kind of compromise, but I also think it's better because yeah. it's a little bit more measured and more considered. So yeah. that's kind of the backstory of how we arrived here. Um, I've had a couple okay. of really interesting conversations. So I've spoken to uh, this morning, mm. I was speaking to the, um, the group uh, marketing executive at NetBank, Ken Sani, Ken Sani Obanda. Um, we were speaking okay. all about uh, um, hurt people and hurt leaders hurt people, um, which was yeah. really cool. So it was her story and just a reflection on where she's at. Uh, last yeah. week, I spoke to the country manager for uh, Coca-Cola, uh, Sanele, a good friend of mine. Um, and we were speaking okay. about uh, uh, loneliness, loneliness in the leadership position, right? So, you know, the higher the wind blows, I mean, the higher the tree yeah. blows, the harder the wind blows type, you know, conversation. Yeah. And then I spoke to a lady who I did my MBA with, um, Namtla Chetu. She's a, an executive at SAA Link, and their business has pretty much you know, gone belly up, and they're trying to figure things out. But I was speaking about corporate forgiveness. So how do you forgive? Like in a corporate context, yeah. you, know, you get managed yeah. by people, and you know, sometimes you just walk around and you carry stuff. Um, and the, 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 yes. the power in, number one, forgiving yourself, but also learning how to forgive people in the corporate context. Yeah. You know? Bosses are not uh, are not yeah. gods, you know. So so that's kind of been the reflections that have that have been on. And obviously, to you, I'm you know, I'm chatting about you know taking on the system and winning because you literally, <laughs> literally <laughs> have done that. Um, and I think and as a more inspiring way to, to to kind of couch your journey, I think that's a really really amazing thing that entrepreneurs face, entrepreneurs face, everybody faces a system that they're dealing yeah. with. And, you know, how do you how do you how do you navigate? Yeah. So. That's, you know, enter, enter your conversation yeah. just as a backstory. So, oh, yeah. so, so I really, really, really yeah. do appreciate your time. Um, I will be very easy mm. with this. I'll yeah. take you through a couple of questions. I send you some stuff to read, but, you know, that's for reference. So if you feel mm. like it makes sense to add, okay. please feel free. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot less, I promise you that. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so just by way of start, I've obviously been following your phenomenal story yeah. um, over the last while on the yeah. book and the platforms. Um, for anyone that hasn't, which would be quite surprising, um, tell can you tell us how the journey is? <laughs> how, how's it all gone? I mean, what what's happened? Um, okay, let me start from the beginning. Um, last year in July, um, I felt something painful in my chest, and you know, I thought, oh, this could be it, but I'm not sure. Went and had like um, some tests done yeah. and, you know, you have those tests. They still don't confirm anything. They're just like, oh, yeah, it's very suspicious. Mm. You need to look into this further. You need to have a biopsy. Um, and interestingly enough, um, this was in Zim. And um, they said to me, because it's in your chest area, you probably will need a plastic surgeon because if you're going to have any surgery, you know, whatever we're feeling has to come out. So it's better you have a plastic surgeon. Right. Only to discover we have two plastic surgeons in the entire country. Wow. Two. Um, yeah. Yeah. Two. Sure. So, <laughs> and, um, so then I started looking for them only to discover they were both out of the country <laughs> and both of them weren't really due back anytime soon. So, <laughs> so you wow. know, you're sitting with this news that, oh, you could possibly have cancer, but you need to wait until all these guys get back. Um, you know, and you're panicking and it's hard to stay calm. So we made the decision to, to fly to Joburg 
and, and rather see someone uh, in Joburg as opposed to waiting. And it's probably a good thing we did um, because then, you know, I had the biopsy and all the relevant tests and that took about two weeks for that to happen. So I'd say from the first time I had my test in Zim till when they gave me the final results, um, my tumor initially was four centimeters by one centimeters, almost like a, almost like a chocolate bar. Wow. Um, and then it had grown to four by five at what? the time. So imagine if I'd had, oh no, let me wait. <laughs> Who knows exactly? Yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> that's the start of this journey and, uh, you know, a, a taste of things to come <laughs> and future complications. Wow. But yeah, so it was a good thing. Um, I flew down to Tegoburg, to yeah, and then started uh, treatment immediately. Um, they give you a treatment plan as soon as, you know, they confirm what it is. And at that stage, it was uh, stage three and what they call wow. HER2 positive breast cancer. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which they say is quite aggressive compared to, I mean, you know, they have different types. You have estrogen positive, progesterone positive, and then HER2 positive. Right. Some people have all three, which I think is probably a bit more daunting. But HER2 positive is, is, is I guess, 20% of people who get breast cancer are HER2 positive. So wow. the other type is the more common. Yeah. So I started uh, chemotherapy so, so, so immediately. Um, so yeah. you, so mm. you come back from Joburg and you, you start treatment in Zim? No. Oh, you start treatment in Joburg? I stayed in Joburg. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because, <laughs> right. you know, once, once you... Once, yeah, because I, I, I identified a surgeon. I went to see him. He then referred me to an oncologist. Um, she then referred me to a radiologist. And what I like about the, the, the healthcare system in, in SA compared to Zimbabwe is they work as a team. So, yeah. you know, once you have your surgeon, your oncologist, your radiologist, they meet weekly um, based on in your case. They're, they're interacting. Um, so, you know, from when you move from one to the next, you're not having to brief them. Uh, uh -huh. once again about what your story is they're already pretty brief they know exactly what's going on so things seem to move a lot faster and a lot more smoothly so mm -hmm. i was happy to <laughs> to start treatment in in Joburg. so you know staying at an airbnb sure. um my sister had flown in from melbourne because she's a doctor so for her i think she understood the horrors of the situation more than i did i was just like oh, okay i have cancer it hasn't really hit me. Um, we'll see how we go. But I'm, um, you know, looking at the horror on her face, I was realizing, oh, okay, this is maybe this a bit is something. More, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so initially, my uh, my chemo was every two weeks, and um, you know, once you have the chemo, you you literally are down and out for for well, for me, it was for four or five days. And so I did the first chemo, stayed in Joburg because, I, you know, the doctors also wanted to assess how do I react, what's going to happen. Um, and thankfully, you know, I didn't react too negatively. They realized, you know, I can see, through, see the treatment through. Yeah. So we, we flew back to them. So it became a case of flying to Joburg, having chemo packing up another set of chemo, flying back to Zim, oh. having that next round of chemo in Zim, and then, yeah, and alternating, basically. Oh. So, yeah, uh, that, was, that was quite, yeah, it was quite taxing. <laughs> um, you know, my sister was there for the first, the first two, but after that, she obviously had to go back to work. So the rest of the journeys, I was doing them by myself because um, my family were here in Zim uh, taking care of my son for me. Uh, amongst the three of them yeah. and um, yeah and you know thankfully I have friends in Joburg having lived in Joburg before so you know mm. I'd have a soft landing when I arrived sure. but yeah that was wow. yeah, it's quite so a, that's, that's <laughs> the beginning <laughs> of the process right and then you, you kind of you, you, you yeah. get through most of it and uh, yes you know, and then you and then the, the story th the, the plot thickens as they say <laughs> Yeah, well, so initially, um, you know, once I started the chemo, then I, I was waiting for, for a certain drug. It's called uh, Herceptin, mm -hmm. which is given to women who are HER2 positive. Um, it really helps in reduce the chances of the cancer coming back. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a drug you need to be injected every three weeks for 12 months. Sure. So initially, I was like, you know, um, you know, you also have to be injected by, you know, a certified physician. It's not one of these like, you know, other like insulin jabs where you can maybe jab yourself. Yeah. Um. So you know, and then it's also 
tricky in terms of storage. It needs to stay certain temperatures between two degrees Celsius and eight degrees Celsius. Mm. So, you know, traveling with it, it had to be, you know, properly packaged. But, you know, with the flights, by the time I'd arrive in Zim, it would be evening. So I wouldn't have time to go to an oncologist or somewhere to store it. So we would be putting it in the fridge at home, hoping there's no power cuts. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hoping, yeah, hoping the backup power system works if there is a power cut because um, we were buying the drug for 13,000 rand for an injection. Right? You yeah. Yes, yes, wow. which, is, which worked out to about 600 US dollars. But looking at it, you know, we were like, but this is too stressful. Maybe let's try and buy it in Zimbabwe. But only to find it was retailing at 2,100 US dollars per vial in Zimbabwe. Wow. My goodness. Yes, yes. So already right at the beginning of my treatment, I was like, whoa, some things are not right here. <laughs> They're really just not making sense at all. Wow. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, I mean, sure. So, so as you go through this process, and obviously you're a powerhouse, you're a marketer, you're a, you know, you're a mother yeah. and you're a daughter, you're all these things. Like yeah. how, how, how were you doing it? Like mentally, how, where were you drawing strength from? Um, are you emotionally uh, tired through the process? Are you physically tired? And, and how are you, you know, how are you keeping yourself strong? Okay, so let me tell you how it feels. Um, so you have your chemo, and for the first sort of 24 hours, you're kind of fine, which is why I was able to, to get on a plane and fly back. But when it hits, it hits so hard. Um, you know, and it, it gradually gets worse with each chemo that you have. So by the time you get to about five or six, you know, you've lost all your hair. Um, you, you've got ulcers in your mouth, so you can't eat. Um, the, the palms of my hands had gone black. The soles of my feet had gone black. My, my skull was black. Um, it's complete skin color change, yeah. <laughs> the, my eyes were completely red all the time, constantly watering. But on top of that, the, like the physical changes are, well, I just had no strength. Like um, I would literally stay in my room, and my room is upstairs in the house where we live. And once I, I was up there, I would be up there for like the next five days. And the amount of energy I had was maybe to get off the bed and go to the bathroom and back. And that was really all I could manage. Oh so, you know, there's a point where you're lying there, you know, because it was also sometimes hard to breathe. You just didn't know what was happening. Like, sure. Because each symptom or each side effect is different for each person. So you can't. You can't phone, you know, day two, did you also go through it? A lot of people will be like, no, you know, I didn't have that or mine was far worse. So, you know, you're, you're really on your own. <laughs> but, um, but I did find strength. I found strength in, first of all, within myself because I'm a single mom. And I remember saying to myself, so if I die, that's it. My son is parentless, you know. Um, and I can't do that to him. He's five. We haven't had enough time. You know, maybe if it was 10 years from now, maybe, I I don't know. I don't know if I'd have a different mindset. But at this stage, you know, it's it's one of the things that really kept me going Mm. was I just can't leave him. I really can't leave him. Um, The other other places I drew strength from were, yeah, were my friends who, I've got a couple of friends who've had cancer before, who've had breast cancer. Oh, wow. And one of them, particularly, she said to me, Tinai, no matter what, just follow the steps. Whatever the doctors tell you to do, even if it's not making sense to you, if you don't have the strength for it, follow the steps. Because there'll be days where you don't want to do anything. You don't want to go anywhere. You don't want to get up. Mm. Um, but as long as if you're saying to yourself, I'm following the steps. And for sure, it did help. It's, it's almost like a mental marker. Because, you know, you have your treatment plan. Uh, when you start treatment. So you already know like the dates when things are supposed to happen. Um, and so for me, I'd be holding on to that. You know, I just need to get to the next chemo or I need to get to the next injection. And then after that, we see how we go. So yeah, that was, that was helpful. But um, yeah, I had a lot of support, a mm. lot of support, friends, family. Yeah. Um, and halfway through the chemo, I took to social media and suddenly I had you know, people I didn't know, <laughs> um, yeah. praying for me, sending me messages, checking in on me. And, and I think that helped a lot as well. Yeah. That really but did help. Yeah. It's funny. I was watching the, there's a Netflix movie um, at the moment called The Social Dilemma. 
Um, yeah. And it, it speaks about all the negative things that come with social media. Um, and yeah. you know, the, the irony is that, you know, they interview a lot of ex, you know, Facebook, Google, et cetera, employees. And because I used to work yeah. with Facebook, I understood exactly what they were saying. It's like, there's not, there's, there's, there's so much good that comes from social media, but there's yeah. also so much inherent bad that is in social media. And so oh, when, they, yeah. when they asked them, so what's wrong with it? And everyone was like, yeah. It's, it's difficult to explain. And in your case, you know, you're getting yeah. people that you don't know praying for you. You've got people that are showing yeah. you support. You're doing, you started to lobby and you started to rally around, you know, some of the challenges that were faced. And, and how did that yeah. go? I mean, how did you, how did you start to gain this movement around, you know, effectively trying to look at how to, how to fix those machines? I mean, I was like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it helped. Um, it helped that halfway through chemo, I went to social media, and it was around about breast, breast, breast cancer awareness month, October. Yeah. And I thought, you know, let me also share my journey because at this point, you know, it's not just an ad campaign put together by some marketing execs. This is me telling my story, and you know, letting people know that yeah, actually, I didn't do the checks. You know, yeah, I didn't follow the advice. I didn't go for the mammogram, and look at me now. Oh. Mm. And, you know, if you want to be in my situation, carry on. But, you know, I strongly advise everyone to, to not be like me, basically. So that's where I started. And it was phenomenal. The response was phenomenal. And, um, you know, people around the world, um, I had people, you know, messaging me and telling me, oh, because of what you said, we've gone and got tested, yeah. we've gone and got ourselves checked out. So that was, that encouraged me. I think that gave me power and strength that, hang on, so I can say things about what's happening to me personally. It's different as a marketer to put together a clever campaign yeah. and talk about your target audience and, yeah. <laughs> and demographics and, you know, the key message and the golden thread. Yeah. This is, you know, this is me just laying myself bare. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, so it felt slightly different. It didn't, I, cause I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, necessarily considering what reaction am I hoping to get? I was just out there like, let me, just, you know, share what I need to share. Let me share what I can. And yeah, it's probably the best response I've ever had in my marketing career, to be honest. Just in terms of authenticity, in terms of people actually engaging yeah. uh, and yeah. people being convinced and changing mindsets and, and, you know, people's point of views. Yeah, it, it was quite powerful. So, yeah. so based on that, um, you know, when we eventually got to the stage that I've, I've finished chemo, I've had the surgery and I'm now doing radiotherapy, which at this stage we've decided to do in Zimbabwe yeah. because it's every day. So are so the doctors now back from holiday? Wherever, wherever they went, did they come back? The, the oh, they came back, but I mean, you know, at this stage, I've completely forgotten about them. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the surgeon I had in South Africa was amazing. He's excellent. Um, hmm. the, and I'll say this because one um, I look at myself and I'm, you can, besides like very tiny scars, you can barely see that, you know, there was anything different. So yeah, his fingers are magic. But on top of that, um, just having seen other health practitioners. So, you know, now when I go for checkups and whatever, he, you know, they're always going on about, this is like the most perfect textbook surgery that we've ever seen. Really? So, you know, um, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of praise. So it's, it's encouraging to know that, you know, I, I had the best, I had the best treatment. Oh, phenomenal. That's <laughs> yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. And so when you started now in, in Zim with the radio, you said the radio. Uh, so I started radiotherapy in Zim um, because it just made sense because it's an everyday thing and radiotherapy does sort of wear you down. So it didn't make sense to be in an Airbnb, you know, by myself, um, in, in Joburg. So, and it also worked out surprisingly, that was the one treatment of all the cancer treatment that I've had that worked out cheaper in Zim. Well, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out of everything, yeah. Okay. So I started that, um, and then we had lockdown. Uh, nine days, nine, nine sessions in. I was due to do 30 sessions of radiotherapy. So nine sessions in, we have lockdown, but that's okay. I'm actually quite chuffed because I'm like, oh, you know, the COVID's happening, but now people have to stay home, which means us cancer patients are a lot safer because the only people we're bumping into on the street are other <laughs> cancer patients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so this is great. So for me, it was, yeah, you know, in our stride, everything's great. Um, then we got to session 21. And um, I'm actually driving to the center and they phone me and tell me, oh, the machine's broke. Oh. So prior to that, it had broken down one or two times before, but it had been one of those where, 
you know, they have um, a local technician and it was something he could fix. So he'd fix it and then the very next day you'd go back. And apparently this is normal because, you know, I'm, a, I'm one of those people who like to research. So you must know everything that's happened during my cancer treatment. Mm. I research everything prior to it happening, while it's happening, if anything <laughs> changes. So I already knew that, okay, this is normal. I'm not too concerned. Mm. So when, initially when they called and said it's broken, I was like, okay, guys, we'll see you tomorrow or the day after when you sorted it out. Great. Um, but then a few days go by and, you know, there's silence and I'm like, huh. Hmm. So now I'm phoning, like, you know, so what's going on? What's up? Um, yeah. And that's when they, you know, they say, listen, the, the problem with the machine is a little more serious. Oh. And um, we're trying to find a, a slightly higher technician. So there is one, but he's in Bulawayo. And at this stage, uh, travel across the country had also been banned because we're right. in lockdown. Yeah. So they're like, you know, we're trying to get special dispensation for him to come. So I'm like, okay, great. Still, you know, positive. Something's happening. Mm. Uh, the guy came, but uh, he couldn't fix it either. Oh. So now the requirement was for, a, a, you know, an engineer from the manufacturer to actually come in and fix it. Wow. But at this stage, there's no international travel. Wow. So, you know, <laughs> so at this point you sort of sit back and you, yeah. And, you know, and then that's when I start doing research about what happens to you. What are your chances of cancer coming back if you miss radiotherapy treatment? Yeah. And to be honest with you, all the research that can be found talks about the impact of missing maybe three days up to five days worth of radiotherapy. There is absolutely no research because it, it seems unfathomable within the cancer community that someone could stop radiotherapy and a month can go by, two months can go by mm. and so on. I mean, you know, these machines were only fixed four months. Four later months. After I see, you know. Wow. Last machine was was broken so you can imagine wow. <laughs> four months, four months later. And, and the thing is you know so the reason why radio four months later four, and it's not even the same as those machines that were fixed for ones that have been broken since last year and those are the ones at the government hospital the, the machine at the private facility is still broken as we speak today sure. they still haven't fixed that one wow yeah. wow, yes. wow 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 yeah. And, and so yeah. now you've got, I mean, I, I'm like, my mind is blown, yeah. right? I, so you've got this machine that's, that, that, <laughs> that you need yeah. to complete your radiotherapy and it can only be fixed by the manufacturer. Um, the manufacturer can't travel clearly yeah. because there's travel bans. Um, and you, 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 yeah. you're sitting there and you're trying to weigh up your odds effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So at this stage, I mean, you know, we're all, because it's a new situation and we're also dealing with the COVID fear. So everyone's just sort of trying to be calm and we're like, let's wait and see. And then there was a time uh, travel started being allowed, like repatriation of citizens and what have you. That's at the point where I started asking, so if flights are not coming into Zimbabwe, why are engineers not flying in as well? Do you know what I mean? Because surely you can fly them in at the same time. Mm. And I wasn't really getting a straight answer from, uh, from the facility, the private facility. And to be honest with you, I'm actually very disappointed with them because to this day, I, I feel like they didn't really, um, they, they weren't very open with their communication. Yeah. And at this stage, I thought, well, you know, let me, let me find out. It's not just me me and you know i remember seeing all the patients who were going for radiotherapy because it's a daily thing there's a whole bunch of us so i'd see people arrive in ambulances because some people their situations are severe then you know some of us would arrive in our cars uh etc and then we'd be having our radiotherapy so i started wondering like so what's happened with these people especially the ones who are in ambulances um the ones who have um you know brain tumors and neck tumors and throat tumors because those are you know those are i think that require immediate attention those you can't just stop radiotherapy you know started trying to find out what's happened to them uh to, only to find that okay so we have one machine in below where it's about 600 kilometers away hmm. and those who could have managed to travel but those who couldn't they're sitting at home well, you know, there's three other machines. <laughs> there's three other machines. Um, wouldn't it be better to to find out what's happening with those? And that's when I started trying to find out, trying to reach out to people. Um, and I imagine I eventually managed to speak to the head of PR for the Ministry of Health. 
Mm. And I'll say this about cancer, because it, it, it's something that always is in the back of my head that, you know, if I wasn't a cancer patient and if this wasn't a cancer issue, would I have had the same kind of response? Because, you know, I, I phoned the guy and I said who I was, told him my situation, and he immediately was responsive. And it was, oh, I've lost a relative from cancer. I've got family members who've had cancer. I know how terrible it is. I've, you know, had firsthand experience of what it is to go through the, well, you know, secondhand experience of what it is to go through this. And immediately he had empathy. So it made it easier to, to then have the discussion. So guys, what's going on? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I don't know if it, it would be the same if, let's say, I'd gone and said, you know, um, our water system, which is one of the issues we have in Zim, yeah. we don't have running water. Yeah, the guy would have been yeah, like, what are you going to do know, about I it? I don't know. If, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. Sure. But yeah, so it was great. I mean, you know, um, so that sort of started that process. But I think what made it difficult is, um, you know, we have so much scandal happening in Zimbabwe. So, you know, he asked me to write a letter. I wrote a letter wrote it on behalf of uh, myself and all cancer patients, um, and then just asked questions like, what is your plan mm. to, to fix these machines? And he then said, I'm going to make sure that your letter is read by the minister, by everybody involved, and I promise you that I'll come back to you with at least some answer. So yeah. I was like, great. But a few days later, um, the news explodes. Our health minister is in a scandal, $60 million, oh. PPE, oh. fraudulently purchased. I don't know. Oh. Uh, he's been arrested. <laughs> <laughs> he's now in jail. So. <laughs> you are no, I'm just, yeah, I remember just like, oh my gosh. Um, so this is the end of my little, you know. <laughs> um, you know, if, uh, yeah. And, not, you know, thinking, well, I don't think there's anything else I can do now um yeah. this is the end of it uh yeah um but then you know still realizing that hang on but there's so many people and if i keep quiet what's going to happen so started just literally in whatsapp groups and everyone that i knew locally saying guys please point me in the right direction who do i need to speak to there must be somebody you can't yeah. you know this whole thing can't die because of a you know a health minister is, is you know being caught in some scandal he's yeah. not the only person he's not yeah. the whole of health in Zimbabwe there's other people in the structures yeah. um and uh, yeah so I was then directed to uh, what would be called the head of the health services board which is a board that monitors um the hospitals who then gave me direct access to the CEO of the hospital uh where the three machines are, are housed it's a right. government hospital called Paranyatwa right. um so I spoke to this guy on the phone he was also like oh let me give you an update we are actually working on this so I thought what oh I'm so shocked. I was expecting to hear, oh, no, we can't help you. We don't know what to do. Oh, really? But it, it turns out, yeah, it turns out he, he, was a, 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 he was relatively new to the post and obviously had come with some sort of energy, seeing the gaps and had been lobbying for this to be fixed. So it turns out they'd um, bought and paid for all the parts that they needed to fix the machines. Oh, wow. They'd taken delivery of them and then COVID happened. So they were now basically trying to figure out how to get the engineers. But I got the sense that it kind of stalled and took a backseat. What with the minister's issue, what with COVID, I, it was no longer, you know, something that's uh, on top of the agenda for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so he, you know, he said to me, what do you need? No, I asked, what do you need? And then he was like, you know, we have to get these things engineer so i was like what is the problem I remember then reaching out to my network well mm. <laughs> discovered that so that was fantastic there were so many people willing to help so many people offering to fly these guys yeah but um eventually you know we we realized that they could actually take one of the re repatriation flights while that's being arranged the the ceo got fired <laughs> you joking so, yes i swear i swear oh, this is like a, yes. this is like a telenovela <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I remember just like, I can't believe this is happening. This is, you know, like you can't, you can't make this up. But yeah, so he got fired. He, him and four other hospital CEOs, I guess, I'm, I'm, to this day, I really don't know the facts, but you know, it, it came soon after the health minister was arrested. So I'm sure they, you know, it's a knock on effect, whatever it is that's happening in the ministry. But sure. I remember at that stage thinking, oh no, not again. <laughs> We're still again. So yeah.
yeah but um i will commend that guy because before he left i mean you know they he then phoned me and said i'm sending you a number this is the person you need to liaise with and you know just keep putting pressure on him to follow up and make sure that this happens okay. so i started doing that um, while i was tweeting but in between all of this um, one of my friends had family members that work at, you know, these international news agencies, managed to reach out to all of them, got a good response from BBC Africa News. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, and they, they phoned me, did a, a radio interview. It ran on the website and then the World Service, the BBC World Service picked it up. And oh. then another journalist called me up. And then she wrote my story. And, and, and that's when it exploded. And I think... Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, that was yeah. the tipping point. That's where things started to change a bit. I think so. I think so. Uh, you know, I was still tweeting furiously. I think I was more on Twitter than Facebook. Uh, still tweeting furiously, uh, but then I started, you know, um, including the manufacturer of of, of the machines, the way the engineers are. Because I'm like, hang on. So you know, it's all happening this side, but what are they doing? So you know, started questioning them as well. Yes. And then one day, um, the CEO of, of uh, they called Varian Medical Systems, the mm. CEO of the Africa division, um, then phoned me out the blue, wow. identified himself and said, good news, we have an engineer, he arrived this morning. Wow. And wow, yeah, wow. Uh, I, that's got to be one of the greatest moments I've had recently. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and all of this because yeah. of the the, in, yeah. the world wide web and the internet it's amazing hey it is it is without leaving the comfort of your home imagine <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely phenomenal so, I mean, yeah. so, so then yeah, the, i didn't need any placards i didn't need to toy toy <laughs> <laughs> you just need fast thumbs that work really well, yeah 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 <laughs> right. so the yeah. so the engineer came out and uh, and, the, and the machine was fixed right and then you, you yeah got, so it was three of them they fixed three machines yeah and you know i got to meet him at the end of it just before he left um yeah. Gosh, he was a tall guy. He must be like seven foot something. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, very nice person. Um, and, you know, in speaking to him and also keeping in touch with, with um, you know, the rest of the variant team, I got to understand that, you know, in as much as this has happened and they fixed the machines, without some sort of service plan or whatever it is, if yeah. the machines break again, we're going to be back. In the, the same, same situation, situation we are in. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So this is where I am at this stage, is actually um, trying to work with the manufacturer and the hospital and the ministry to see how can we then, you know, create some sort of situation of continuity. So it's not yeah. over. Yeah. You know, yes, machines are fixed. Yes, people are now getting treated, which is beyond fantastic. Yeah. But um, I think because because I, I wasn't aggressive, I wasn't attacking, I was, I, you know, I spent more time asking questions. Why? Why hasn't this happened? Why isn't this happening? And then also just expressing what I know will happen in terms of, you know, so if, if I don't get this treatment, you know, I'm either going to have to have a mastectomy, my cancer is going to come back. Yeah. You know, just letting people know that we as patients are also aware of what the impact is okay. to us for lack of action. Yeah. And, you know, then just hoping people have a conscience. And you know what? Surprisingly, they do. They do. Mm. You know, you, you, you read all these news stories and, you know, um, institutions are vilified and they're made to, to look like monsters. And, you know, like right now we have a situation of striking doctors and nurses yeah. and in as much as you sympathize with them you know there's a part of you that you like but you know there are people dying in hospital or whatever but until you actually meet these people and you you speak to them and then mm. you realize hey hang on these these people are human just like you and me yeah. they you know and they actually have a level of empathy and, and it's great because it's easier to have conversations and real conversations about okay, so this is what's happening. And, you know, they speak truthfully and honestly. Well, that's been my experience True. of, you know, how far can they help? How much can they actually do? And what are their limitations? So that, that's been great. That's True. Been really great. And, how, and how are you feeling now, Tendai? How are you, you know, physically, how are you feeling spiritually, emotionally? Where are you at? <laughs> physically, I'm um, great. Um, I've been given the all clear. So imagine after all of that, um, yeah, I, I had a, a run of tests in preparation of, of continuing the radiotherapy mm. um, and um, only to discover that, you know what, the cancer didn't 
come back. I didn't have any rogue cells that needed to, obviously the, whatever radiotherapy and all the other treatment I had really worked. So right. I don't need to actually do the radiotherapy. So I'm not doing that. And I have one last injection of Herceptin on Friday next week and then I'm done. Oh, wow. I'm free. Wow. I am wow. done with cancer treatment. I, I don't know if it can be called remission. I'm not too sure about the terminology, yeah. but I am cancer free. <laughs> that is so, so I feel liberated. Um, <laughs> I feel whole again. I, I do. It's weird. There, there, there was a part of me that always just didn't feel 100% right, but somehow being told these magical words that, you know, you're now okay. Mm. I do feel whole. Um, and I feel, I feel almost like I have super powers. feel a little bit in invincible actually right now. Like I can do anything. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I'm ready to tackle whatever it is that comes my way. You well, know? after being through what you've been through, I mean, it's not, no wonder you feel that yeah. way. Um, I mean, if I was yeah. to ask you, I mean, as a, as a parting thought, right? So the 21-year-old Tendai um, who, you know, has got the world ahead of her, uh, what would you tell her uh, now that you've been through this experience? Because there may be, you know, many ten dies out there in the world right now, um, young, old, you know, you name it, um, that are either facing systemic challenges or facing their own challenges. What, what, what parting thoughts would you leave them with? Well, the one is, is the lesson that I learned from, from having cancer is nothing's permanent. Nothing is forever. So whatever situation you find yourself in, um, don't allow the feeling of, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the rest of my life and it ends here. Mm. You know, get on top of you. Always believe that things will change. Things will change. Sometimes you can be the orchestrator of your change, but sometimes, you know what, you don't actually need to. It'll change. It'll mm. change. I mean, look at us. Who thought this time last year we would be where we are right now, mm -hmm. locked down, mm. doing Zoom calls <laughs> for meetings? <laughs> things have changed. And you know, if we sit and look this time next year, <laughs> this time next year, we'll be in a completely different situation. Things, things change. So, you know, accept that. But I think also never stop asking questions. Always ask. Always ask, no matter how much you feel you know or understand, always ask and get more clarity. Because, you know, in asking the questions is how I got to where I am now in terms of getting answers about machines, about my treatment, about what works. Always ask, have an inquisitive mind. Don't ever feel like you know everything just because you've gone through something or whatever it is. Always, always appreciate the inquisitiveness that you have within you. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you for fighting. Always. And, I, and, I, and I, <laughs> I take my hat off to you, Haig. You know, you've been through a process where, you know, and I think in, even in the Africa context, asking questions in such a way that you don't get angry or become disrespectful or, you know, you've obviously managed that extremely well. Um, so I take my head off yeah. to you because there's that fine line as well. Um, which I think would not have gotten you as far as it uh, as you have. So well done. Yeah, uh, no. The trick the trick was to before you make a phone call, scream as loud as you can, <laughs> get all the anger out. Yeah, honestly, honestly, and then make the phone call, and then you know have like very calm tones. It helps. You know, I, I mean, think about it. Even just on a on a normal day to day basis, if someone um, approaches you in a very aggressive manner, you're going to automatically be defensive. You're yeah. automatically not going. To it won't, you know, it won't go well. So yeah. rather always have the, the calm approach. I think that helps, um, you know, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, have a conversation where you're equipped with as many facts as possible yeah. so that, you know, even if someone is poking at your calmness, hold on to your facts, they'll help you stay calm, <laughs> <I> promise <laughs> I'm going to use that one. I'm going to start yeah. screaming before I make phone calls. I think it's going to be yeah. my thing. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Well, Tendai, thank you. Thank you so much. Firstly, you are an absolute inspiration. Um, I, as I said, I've followed your story and I've just been like, I cannot believe this is happening, but you have emerged absolutely victorious and uh, and you're looking fantastic, by the way. Your your hair is uh, growing back out. You've got a fantastic yes, it's grown hair. back. So, I, it's grown back. I lost it 10 days into treatment. It was wow. all gone. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Really, you've got like a, I said, a, nothing is permanent. Look. It's back. <laughs> You've got the good genes. You got that good genes. So well done. And uh, and thank you for your time. I really do appreciate having oh, this conversation. You.